There goes the fly ball towards left field. Going back fast is Kennedy. Kennedy gets there, and he takes it. And the Cleveland Indians are the world champions of 1948. And this is Cleveland's team, a baseball history podcast. A regular look back at professional baseball in Cleveland from 1901 and beyond. Now, here's your host, Guardians team historian, Jeremy Fedor. Start at the the beginning. So, you know, I think you're a unique, you know, individual in our history insofar as you're an Ohioan and you, you played at Ohio State. I think there's only a handful of guys that ever came out of Ohio State to actually, you know, play for... Actually, you played for both Ohio teams, too, mm-hmm. but to play for yeah. for us, um, I think Swisher was probably the last one, too. But, um, you know, growing up, were you most likely a Reds fan, just in terms of where you grew up? Yeah. Um, we didn't get a lot of Reds games, but Channel 43 always had the Indians on. Oh. So I probably saw more Indians baseball than I did. I didn't watch a lot, period, because I was always playing. Okay. Not necessarily baseball, but just anything I could to stay busy. Uh, so I didn't watch a whole lot of baseball, but... Yeah, I was a big, how could you not be a 75, 76 Reds fan? Um, and I grew up, I hate to say this, but I was a, a Dodgers fan as well. Um, I like Steve Garvey and obviously Pete Rose, but um, my buddy up the street would play wiffle ball and he was the Red, so I had to, my favorite player, Steve Garvey, so I was the Dodgers and you had to bat whatever hand they bat if they batted mm-hmm. left you had to hit left of course your favorite player always got a hit it was always a hit regardless of it you know so that was just I guess uh how I started my baseball career I don't know how to say it uh more of a Reds fan than I was Indians but like I said I, I saw more Indians but, you know the hard grove how could you not see the rain delay thing um but that's what I remember about watching baseball when I was a kid. Did you ever make the trip up to the old stadium when you were a kid, or? I got to. Uh, I got called up one uh, one road trip. It was our last, their last game in the old Cleveland Stadium. Not the one, not the last, but the yeah. the series. It was a Sunday, so I got to got to be in the stadium. Never got to play there, but got one game in the stadium. Now you kind of hit on something. I think most of the guys that come through here is. Multi-sport athlete in high school then? Was that your, what what were you playing back in in high school? I was a uh, football, basketball, baseball. Not in any particular order, but. Was baseball clearly your your path forward, do you think? Or were you getting offers from? I was getting offers, not necessarily Division I, but I got uh, some basketball. I got uh, a few football. Um, But majority were baseball. And I pretty much had known that was probably my best sport, but. Um, you never know, yeah, yeah. right? You never know. And, I mean, do you see that, I guess? It seems like it's a problem for kids now. It's just that early specialization in, in sports. I mean, you have kids that are, you know, 10, 11 years old that are just yeah. doing one sport. I mean, it seems like most guys and might even see it now in the field. Those guys probably played, uh, you know, I think I was talking to, was it Cody Allen was the quarterback for his high school team. Like, you know, the specialization just seems to not work too well or it's not good for development or I mean you think I think sports? it's I think it's great for development okay uh teaches you how you use your body in different ways um there's different areas in different sports uh you know football and basketball is a very disciplined sport uh you know know your job know your what your what your job is on defense on offense um being in the right place at the right time, how do you how to move your feet and you get on the baseball field and it kind of just carries over. Mm-hmm. And that's that's what I experienced with it. Um, anybody that would ask me, I'd say definitely play a different sport because you're going to learn how to use your body better and learn how to control it and become a better athlete. And being an Ohio guy, was it always Ohio State for you? Was that an easy decision, or was it? Uh, oh no, it was it, it was lucky, is what it was. Um, I had gotten a letter, but my parents were always harping on me about my grades. You got to get good grades, good grades, good grades. I said, oh, my athletics will get me a scholarship. Well, yeah. They kept saying no, it won't, no, it won't. And I kept saying, yeah, it will, yeah, it will. Well, when it came down to it, my grades weren't very good. Uh, until I started applying myself, but by that point it was too late. Um, but anyway, I got a, a, a trip to Indiana, and the coach told me uh, we're very interested, and 
so I went home, told all my buddies, hey, you know, and I'm thinking I might go to Indiana, it'd be awesome. And then I got a letter in the mail, and this is right during basketball season, and I'm a pretty good basketball player, averaged 17 points a game. And um, Friday and Saturday night, I don't know if I got double digits in either game, and my parents knew something was up, and they asked me, what's wrong with you? And I said, nothing. You know, nothing's wrong. And they're like, no, something's wrong. Well, my mom lost something. She's digging through the trash, found my letter. So well, right away they knew what was up. And so they sat me down and said, hey, don't worry about where you go. You know, it doesn't have to be Indiana. I know that you probably wanted to go there, but something will work out. So started, I uh, got, got recruited to go to Anderson. You know, they knew I was going to play baseball. Once I got there, the football and the basketball coach got to, Got, started calling and hounding me every day. Hey, can you you'll play football as a freshman? You'll play basketball as a freshman. I'm like, yeah, well, I don't know if I can do it academically. The baseball coach never called me because he knew I was playing baseball. So these were trying to get me to play all three, and um, I pretty much made up my mind that I was going to play football and baseball and played in a travel ball tournament in Columbus, Ohio, and Ohio State's coach saw me, asked me to get visit, and they offered me uh, – not a scholarship, but a walk-on. And if I proved myself academically and obviously athletically, a scholarship would be in the future. Well, I weighed the cost of going to Anderson and probably what it would have cost to go to Ohio State. And I have to play football if I go to Anderson and Saturday mornings aren't gonna be fun. <laughs> so. That's how Ohio State worked out, but I, yeah, I was very lucky with my grades. You know, today, no chance. And yeah. oh, sorry. So I'm sorry. I, I didn't mean to interrupt, but just one, one of the most things I'm proud of is that I did graduate. And when did you start realizing that you know the scouts were looking at you in terms of, of making it a professional career? Um, well, the, I had out of high school. I, I threw 80 in high school. Um, my my summer league coach sat me down took me to lunch one day and said hey the, the Yankees want to take you as a free agent after the draft would you be interested I said uh, I, I don't know I said I've never even thought about that I'm going to go play professional baseball I'm 17 years old and he's like well that's why I'm sitting you down and talking to you about it Dave I don't think you're ready for that and if it doesn't work out they're just going to shuffle you aside so I would suggest going to college, and but I just wanted to let you know that the opportunity was there. So I went home, talked to my mom and dad about it, and they were like, no chance. You're not doing that. So uh, to answer your question, um, got to Ohio State. My sophomore year, I did really well in the uh, summer league in Virginia. So I started seeing some scouts come to the game, and then my junior year, there's a dozen, 18 guys back there with radars every game. Um, so that's when you kind of realize, hey, something's up. But I was kind of naive. I just went about my business, worked hard, and did what I was supposed to do to help my team win. And fortunately enough, I did get drafted. And you get a phone call, I imagine, second round with uh, with Seattle, and then you're just packing your bags and. and mm -hmm. Well, um, I had gotten a call from the the um, St. Louis Cardinals asking me about first round, what kind of money it would take. I had no idea. I'm like I don't know what's what's first rounder get, and he's like, well, we can't tell you that. I said, well, how do you expect me to come up with a number then? Well, we need you to give us a number. I said, okay, a hundred. I said, I don't know what to tell you. That's, you asked for a number, I gave you a number. Well, 7 o'clock at night, I finally get a phone call. Hey, this is Tom Mooney with the Seattle Mayor. I said, who? <laughs> so I was expecting St. Louis or somebody, but uh, the Reds were interested. I talked to the Reds, but never spoke to Seattle. That's why it was kind of shocking. But, yeah, finally got a call at 7 o'clock. All my buddies came up. We celebrated. Of course, I called my parents. And, did you know the whole thing? But buddies drove up from Springfield, and we had quite the evening. Um, so you get your your debut, um, so, so September eighth, nineteen ninety. What uh, what do you remember about getting that call up? 
Uh, the call-up was kind of weird because we were in the playoffs um, in AAA, and I was expecting, you know, not to get called up. Uh, they said, you know, it was a possibility, but we wouldn't know. They'll let us know sometime tomorrow or the next day who's going to go, and they never said anything. So I got a save that night in the first game or something. I pitched, uh, pitched the next night, got a save, I think, and – I'm sitting and they called me in the office said, hey, you're going up, about three or four of us. And we're in, you know, in the AAA playoffs, but three or four of us went up and I, I just remember being shocked. I wasn't expecting it. I thought there was a possibility after we went to the playoffs, but it was kind of, kind of sudden, but I knew it was a possibility because they had, you know, our manager had mentioned there's a possibility there's going to be four or five guys get called up. Everybody kind of looks around. You kind of figure out who the four or five guys are. So I knew that the possibility I was one of them. And when they didn't, like I said, when the playoffs started and they didn't move any guys, I just figured, well, maybe after playoffs. And when you get made to the majors, anyone that you remember taking under their wing or mentors in terms of your first few years in the majors? Anyone? No. Well, never had that. Um, now, people are going, oh, he must not have been a very good guy. Just, I don't know, never had. All my other teammates always had a guy. Uh, I remember getting in San Francisco. I got I got traded to San Francisco, and Rod Beck was telling me, hey, so-and-so just bought me a pair of boots. I'm like, oh, that's nice. And I go, what, what was that for? He goes, well, he's been showing me around. He's kind of mentoring me. And I'm like, oh, that's cool. So I didn't get jealous. I just was wondering why, I don't know kind of weird uh, somebody asked me if anybody was and I said no um, I made sure of it though when I was in that position that I did one, one way or the other whether I just picked one kid or I just kind of helped them all in a way uh, the best I could or you know give them advice or let them know that they're here to help us win don't be don't think you're a rookie that you're you're here to help and kind of make them feel you know part of the team right away instead of them walking around on eggshells and you kind of moved around quite a bit early on too and to get the news that you were going to uh to Cincinnati must have been pretty cool then yeah uh kind of that was definitely a out of left field had no idea actually I was in the uh we'll say in the men's room uh for the game and my uh, bullpen coach comes in and says, hey Burr, Dusty wants to see you in the office. I'm like, well, <laughs> uh, he's like, right now? I'm like, well, I can't really make it right now. And he's like, no, we need you in there now. And I'm like, I'll be in there as soon as I can. So I got in there and Dusty was kind of crying and told me that I'd been traded. I was like, wow, I wasn't expecting that and I don't think he was either, but uh, turned out to be a blessing. Got to go to the playoffs. Made it to the NLCS that year in '95 with the Reds. Um, but yeah, just a blindsided. You know, wasn't expecting it. And actually, three of us got traded off the off the team and went to a uh, pretty special team. I mean, we we had probably Barry Larkin. Obviously, I can I didn't want to say we didn't have any superstars. Obviously, Barry Larkin's a superstar, but. It was just a good group of guys, and just every day somebody did something. And if you came into town on a four-game series, you had to fight to get that last game. I mean, it wasn't just, well, you beat us seven to four, we'll beat, get you. It was like came down to the last second or always a nail-biter if they did beat us. And it was a lot of fun. And so you spent a few years near home in Cincinnati, and then you get the, the call to then in, in 98 to uh... – Go out to Cleveland. That wasn't a was that a free agent? No, it was a trade for Sean Casey. Sean Casey, yes. Yeah. So um, I was opening day starter for the Reds. That's another story. Uh, yeah, I got to go to practice. We got like a three o'clock afternoon practice. Try to you know try to get out there. We play the first game of the year at noon or twelve oh five the yeah. next day. So kind of an early day. Get home. Get a nice meal. Get ready to get ready to for opening day. Well, I go do my throwing, go do all my prep stuff. And, hey, Burb, you want to take BP? Hey, absolutely. Who doesn't like to take BP, right? 
So I go take my BP and they say, hey, uh, they want to see you in the office. I'm like, that's weird. I must have, must be something to do with maybe the game's going to be delayed a little bit with all the ceremonies and the first pitches and don't worry about being ready at 12.05. Maybe, you know, be ready to come on the field at 12 some sort of thing. Yeah. Just, and then they said, hey, we're good news, bad news, we're trading you to Cleveland. I'm like, okay, well, what's the bad news? We're trading you to Cleveland. I said, what's the good news? We got Sean Casey. I'm like, oh, okay. I didn't know. I knew the uh, Indians went to the World Series the year before, so I was like, I think it's great news. <laughs> so, yeah, we got to uh, got to go to the ALCS that year. It didn't, uh, didn't pan out for us. I mean, you had... In- you were in the league, so you had to know what was going on in Cleveland during that 95, 96, you oh, know, sure. the, the magic and, and the, the lineups that those teams had. So I imagine there's probably some uh, excitement to pitch with that kind of offensive support. Well, um, it was definitely a, uh, what do I say, a, a comfort, mm-hmm. okay? Uh, but the best thing that I can remember about pitching here in Cleveland was we were sold out every night. <laughs> The energy was incredible. Even when I wasn't pitching, I was felt like I was ready to kill somebody. Uh, athletic wise, <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, it was just the energy was tremendous. Uh, obviously, we had a super offense, basically an all-star team. I, I think so. There was a lot of great players. Um, even the guys that you know weren't the Roberto Alomar mm-hmm. or the Tony, they were still top-tier players and all-star caliber and heck yeah it was fun to pitch for him did you notice any more attention like in your personal life from fans being in this this cleveland whirlwind of a an era than you you know when you were in cincinnati or or giants or whatever i mean was there more except i grew up in the era and i remember just the fanaticism and how wild it was and i don't know how it was like as a player uh, i to be honest with you i was um i'm a people person so I don't shy away from it. Uh, I always signed after the game. I'd be out there 15 minutes or 20 minutes signing autographs, and my wife always knew it. If we were going somewhere, hey, I got to sign autographs, regardless. If we we're going to go see a movie and we had 15 minutes to get there, well, we're going to be 15 minutes late. So um, I just that's something that I felt responsible for, and and actually didn't. Wasn't a problem. I enjoy it. I, you know, if somebody wants my autograph, I'm honored. So I always sign that. But as far as going out in Cleveland, when I go out with my family or if I was just by myself, people never really bothered me. Every once in a while, they'd come up and ask me for an autograph, but they knew who I was most of the time, but treated me just like I was supposed to be there, just like the next person. What was it like getting to, you know, watch future Hall of Famers like Jim Tomey out there every day and, uh, you know, seeing what, what he could do, and that had to be pretty special, too, to see those lineups and Manny. Well, of course, um, you know, playing the game, you recognize, guy. hey, this guy could be a Hall of Famer, and you recognize things like that because you get to watch him, and you get to watch him do special stuff, and, you know, Jim comes up, hits a 500-foot home, home run, you just stand there like, it doesn't surprise me, you know, I'm used to it. Robbie Alomar playing defense, stealing bases, stealing – pitchers pitches just student of the game he can sit there and talk to you and tell you what the pitcher's going to throw um you know i still feel that there's probably possibility some other hall of famers on that team but uh we'll see and how is grover as a manager too i like mike uh he he let us be he was a player's manager um had expectations but very lax as far as you know, the rules or anything, be professional, obviously. Um, we didn't have to worry about a bunch of stuff, but be ready to play the game at 7.05. There's nothing better than that rule. If you can't be ready to play 7.05, then what are you doing? So I think everybody at this, at this level is mature enough. They know what they need to do, and there doesn't need to be a lot of rules. And I think Mike did a good job of that when it was time to stick his foot down. He took care of it. How many, and I'm sure you've gotten this question a lot too, but that, that game in uh, 01, I mean, I don't know how many pitchers go out and have, you know, it was 
you're gonna have a rough start every now and then. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, get pulled and down by 12 runs, get a no decision. I mean, do you? Is that something that you in the moment were just? It felt like any other game. Well, we scored a few runs, make it respectable. Or when did for you? Did you kind of perk your ears up and say, "Oh, I'm gonna start paying attention to that"? Well, um, that was a horrible year for me. Um, so when that, when all that was going on, I just I was already going through some. I you know I'll call it purgatory. Uh, used to used to be in an innings eater, pitching six, seven, eight innings, and now I'm now I can't hardly get out of third inning. And it's killing the bullpen, and I'm wearing this on my shoulders big time. And here comes Seattle, and here I go again. I'm done in the second inning, and just beside myself, I don't know, you know, what what happened. I won 16 games last year. I pitched 200 plus innings. And just a million things on my mind, and you know, paying attention, 13 to four, or 12 to four, and 13 to eight, you know, whatever. And you're like, holy shit. Next thing you know, there's Omar, and I'm like, no way no way and that was that was awesome it's history everybody goes hey i saw you on tv i go yeah that was history don't worry about the score (laughs) (laughs) um one of the things i like to ask pitchers about too is feller used to be around a lot spring training or or fantasy camps or whatever do you have any good stories with bob or what was it like to just have that presence, uh, you know. I have a lot of great. Well, I don't. Want, I don't necessarily want to call him great, but I have a lot of um, conversations with Bob. Just uh, most of it, he liked to talk about himself a lot, but uh, I didn't mind it because he deserves it, and he, it wasn't. People misunderstood sometimes that he's talking about himself, but that's just how he talked. It wasn't necessarily bragging. He just was saying this is what what was was. But a lot of people thought. You know, he brags about himself, but to me, I just thought, hey, he did it. He's just, we're just talking about it. I asked him the questions, so he's answering the questions. And um, always, wherever I was at, always spoke to me, always, hey, Burb, how you doing? Good, good to see you, Bob. You know, we have a little banner and just awesome guy. And I think that's why he was always around because you could talk to him and there wasn't any barriers or he didn't mind talking to anybody. And I always enjoyed him, so anytime I had the opportunity to speak to him or at least say hello, I took advantage of it. You know, and, and I guess going back to Bob, and then just baseball being a sport that's so steeped in its its history. When you were coming up, was that something that that went through your mind? Like, hey, I'm pitching out at Fenway, where you know these greats have been, or I'm out at Wrigley, where you know these greats have been. Was that something for you that you cared about when you were younger, or is that something maybe as you look back at it now, you're like? You know, I was just a dumb kid pitching at these, uh, you know, historic ballparks against these. Oh no, teams. you you take all that in everywhere you go. Um, you know, growing up watching World Series and you see Yankee Stadium or you see this stadium and and man, I remember watching so and so play here and now I'm playing here. Um, absolutely, Boston. I made my debut there in the big green wall and I got to go back and sign the wall and. Yankee Stadium with uh, the old Yankee Stadium where they had the the park out there and it's just kind of a I don't want to say eerie feeling but it is because I'm amongst Mm -hmm. not because I play baseball but I'm in the same area that these greats played and it's just you can feel it it's kind of weird and now it's not there anymore but hopefully they moved it over into the new stadium I, I haven't been there yet any particular batter that you just felt always had your number anytime he was up to just stick the bat out and poke it out and all of them <laughs> <laughs> i had troubles uh, i was a down away guy so um mike piazza frank thomas gave me problems and um larry walker mm-hmm. for some reason they you know some guys just see the ball off it ken griffey dude <laughs> junior really didn't have a problem either um but that's just the way it is, you, you know. Um, you face career. another guy and he can't hit you. And he's the greatest hitter in the world, but he just can't hit you. It's kind of funny, but that's how the game works. And anyone ever, again, when you were younger coming up, just surreal, you're in the on the mound and so and so is in the batter's box and you're just, you know. Well, it's funny you ask that because I was going to tell you the story earlier. 
So we're in Cincinnati, a bunch of kids. Dad takes us to the ballpark, right? We're going down and watch the big red machine, and uh, Expos are in town. There's a gentleman named Warren Cromartie playing left field. And I believe it was Warren Cromartie. I hope I don't screw this story up, but I'm pretty sure it was him. We, we were, throw us a ball, throw us a ball, you know? Whole game, and there wasn't a whole lot of people in the left field bleachers, but there was enough, but he knew who was yelling at him because we were constantly yelling. And uh, finally, about the seventh inning, he throws us up a ball. And my buddy jumps up to catch it, and it tips off to his hands. And I see it pop up, and I tip off of mine, and I turn behind, and there's this little girl on the ball just goes, bloop. <laughs> and we're like, hey. Ha oh. <laughs> so we're, you know, we're like, thanks, dude, thanks, dude. So I was pitching in Kansas City, and Randy Johnson to pitch eight innings, and I'm going to come in and finish the game and come out to pitch the bottom of the ninth. And now batting for his last major league at bat, Warren Cromartie. And I'm like, oh my God. And I never got to see him, I never got to tell him the story. I got him to ground out, hit a ground ball to second base, but I was like, holy cow. So I hope that's the kind of story you're looking for. Yeah, it's wild. Um, do you, uh, you know, now as a fan, I guess, too, you miss the National League pitchers batting? I do. Um, I loved it as a, as a player. It's definitely uh, an element of the game that you have to take serious. Not necessarily the hitting part, getting your bunts down. Mm -hmm. um, that's what you're expected to do. But, you know, some of these guys throw some pretty nasty stuff. It's not easy. And that's what you kind of take pride in is make sure you're getting your button down. But when you do get that chance to swing it, it's it's definitely fun. I loved it. And I, I guess besides the obvious, you know, pitch timer and whatnot, how much have you? Do you think the game's kind of changed since you've lost pitch? I mean, just some of these guys are throwing things that seem. You know, it eventually has to plateau. I'd imagine the human arm can't throw. Yeah. Well, hours. that's why you're seeing millions of arm surgeries too. Mm -hmm. um, Maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. I don't look at it that way. If you can throw it 105 and get an arm, get your arm operated and come back a year and a half and keep doing it for another five or six years, okay, that's up to you. Um, but pretty special that you can throw it that hard. So take advantage of it. What What do I think about it? I think that the, you know all the shifts and all that stuff. I think baseball should be played baseball. Obviously, you put the guys where they belong, where they're supposed to be positions. You can move them a little bit. But then on the other hand, you got a guy that's up to plate and he's got the whole left uh, side of the infield and he doesn't just take the bat and hit the baseball over there. I never understood that one either. Uh, all the analytics and stuff, you know, I'm a pitching coach. Um, I get it, but I don't get it because you still need to know how and, and when and why and there's a lot of things and besides just getting a spin rate or a vertical angle approach and all that. Obviously, that's, those are tools that help you get hitters out, but the bottom line is always execution. And just coming back to Cleveland, I mean, is that, you know, you've been quite a few places in your career, but Cleveland kind of hold a, a special place in your Absolutely, it does. Um, sold out every night. Uh, got to go to the playoffs three of the four years I was here. Should have went the fourth year. We lost by a half game or a game or something. Um, not saying it was because of me. It's just we had a great team. I mean, great clubhouse, great uh, great teammates, great city to play in. Fans obviously sold out every night. Um, treated us well. Uh, so definitely, hands down, this was this was it. Do you are you able to kind of follow along with with? Our seasons at all, or I had a little bit. Um, of course, they're you know they're in my heart. Um, do I get mad if they won or lost? I don't really pay attention. I know they have to win out, and Twins have to lose. No, nah, it's over now. Okay, well that's that's tough, but um, still a heck of a year. Uh, when you have a chance to go to the playoffs, it's always a it's always a successful year. I don't know how the how the Indian or excuse me the Guardians. Um, I probably said Indians about a hundred times in this interview. No, no. Uh, well, that makes sense. Though, you were, you played yes, in Indians, yes. so there's no. So it's kind of hard for me to get to, used to the Guardian thing. So excuse me if I say it wrong, all, but all fun. I was a Cleveland Indian. Yeah, proud of it. Yeah. Um, is it? 
I mean, Cleveland too, I guess, as a former pitcher, have you been able to, you know, since, since you've been gone, I mean, there's been several Cy Young winners and just, you know, watching Corey Kluber, I don't know if you pay attention to, you know, just our, our factory of, of pitching, I mm-hmm. guess. It's, it must They're be, talking uh, about it's a factory. Yeah. There's a bunch of guys coming through. Yeah. It's great. That's what wins. Gee, that's funny. You guys are winning. Um, well, I think that kind of covers us. We'll wait till Nate comes back. Okay. And go. Nate, we finished, baby. We're good. You've been listening to Cleveland's Team, a baseball history podcast with Guardians team historian Jeremy Fedor.